Five minutes past ten, our talkback lawyer David Whiting in just a second, 1300 222 774. David's here to take your calls to provide you with free legal advice. The number, if you'd like some free advice, 1300 222 774. That's the number, 1300 222 774. And David, good morning to you. Good morning, John. I noticed we got a new Chief Justice of the Family Court during the week, but the Family Court much diminished from where it used to be. So what's happening? Well, it's not yet diminished, but it's diminishing. The um, There's a proposal that the Federal Government has put forward to merge the Federal Circuit Court uh, with the Family Court. And, that's, uh, and the current head of the Family Court retires having reached the age of statutory senility in uh, November. And uh, so Will Olstergren, a Victorian uh, judge, who's head of the circuit court, becomes the head of the family court upon John Pascoe's retirement. Um, uh, Now, you know, there's a fair amount of consternation about what that actually means. But the, and the interesting thing will be that all of the appeals will go to the federal court. Yep. Uh, and the federal court doesn't have any judges with lots of experience in family law matters. So it will be you know, an interesting time, John, particularly well, when there's a suggestion that the Australian Law Reform Commission is looking into whether the merger should happen at all. And the view very much of the people who work in the field, not just the lawyers, not just the solicitors and the barristers, but the people who work in the family law jurisdiction as counsellors, as assistants, as family violence workers, um, they're all pretty annoyed. I nearly said a bad word. Uh, they're all pretty annoyed about it. They all well, think Well, I, I think they're upset about it, John, because they just don't see... Uh, I mean... They don't see how it's going to make things better for the people who they all try to help. And if you dedicate your life to trying to help people and they're changing the system that's to a way that makes it harder... No wonder you get annoyed. Well, if there's a 40-year specialist jurisdiction that's been set up with principles and support mechanisms and everything else, and now all of that's being well, emerged, and in the merger there will be a, there'll be, I would have thought, a significant change probably for the worse. Uh, the loss of specialisation, yes. loss of the multidisciplinary approach, which has been an absolute cornerstone of the approach to family law in Australia since the 1970s. Yeah. So uh, 1st of January 1976, it came into effect. So it's lasted 43 years, and we'll see what happens. Hmm. All right. Uh, In South Australia, John, there was... uh, Henry Keogh was convicted of the drowning death of his 29-year-old fiancée in 1994. In 1985, there were two trials. Sorry, in, 19... in 1994, he was he was the, the death occurred in 94. There were two trials in 95, and he was convicted. In 2015, an appeal court ruled that the jury in his second trial was misled by one of the major witnesses for the twenty prosecution. years after. Twenty years after. So he was in jail for twenty years. Twenty one years he spent in jail, and then got an appeal. And then got an appeal because presumably the witness was discredited in some other proceeding and therefore there was an appeal. The appeal court recommended a third trial. And in South Australia, there was a change of government, the new government, and I'm not saying the change of government was an influence. uh, They paid him compensation for the 20 years that he spent in jail. And now the family is agitating that the third trial ordered in 2015 should take place. The family of the deceased. The family of the deceased wants is saying, him tried again. Wants him tried again for the third trial, even though he's already served a sentence. He's received a sentence, John, and he received compensation longer. for the sentence that he's likely to get. One would have thought so. Yeah. Yes. Hmm? But we, I mean, at the moment, we therefore there's nothing on the record about who killed this young woman. No. I can see why they think that. Yeah. That they want that. But a third trial, twenty years on. Oof. So uh, it's it's not the not a perfect system, is it? The one you work in? No, it's not. I mean, it's not perfect from anyone's point of view. You, you actually. I mean, the way I explain it to people, John, is that you, the engagement with a lawyer is an investment, and you have to see that there's a return that's commensurate with the investment that you make. Yes, and it's not always measured in money terms. No, and people often approach the system thinking, "Ah, look, I will get the answer that is the only answer, which is the one that I want." Well, I've learned that just about everything is grey, John. Yeah. Yes. And no one ever gets... Dark grey, light grey, almost, but grey. Almost never do people get everything they set out to achieve. No. no. And yet that capacity to 
compromise your expectations as much as anything else is very, very difficult for a lot of people. And they think, oh, well, I'll just go and get the best lawyer I can afford and then that will secure me the outcome I'm seeking. Well, we've just settled a matter, John, that involved a property dealing and it's taken us four years. Four years. We've got the instructions in September 2014 and we resolved the matter in September 2018. Particularly but, complex? No. Uh, Oh, lots of personalities, no litigation. We didn't actually issue. We what? Never, you never issued proceedings that took four years of negotiations. Well, there were there's lots of posturing and running around, but we resolved it in four years without spending hundreds of thousands of. Uh, I mean, we spent hundreds of thousands anyway, but but we didn't in the end issue proceedings, and it's just a, uh, you know, that's part of the part of the job. Mm. Um, Anyway, that one was resolved, and and the ABC News had a, a news report. I interrupted you, David. John, there was we, one more piece of information. One more piece of information was that uh, workplace health and safety invest, are investigating in Queensland the death of a four-year-old boy injured in a spring set accident while staying at an Airbnb in Queensland. And the the article discusses whether or not, if you have an Airbnb property, whether or not you have the benefit of the cover for people who are paying guests. Now, Excellent. most insurance covers volunt, you know, house guests paying guests, so the suggestion is that you should check your insurance policy. Uh, not that any of us can understand it, even when we try to read it. Peter in Northcote. Morning to you, Peter. Good morning, John. Morning, David. Hey. Welcome. Hi, I've got an issue on behalf of my uh, daughter and her partner who have just moved back into Melbourne, and they moved into a house in uh, Doncaster. They were encouraged to sign the uh, lease and move in within a week, and we helped them move from the country down. It was a big move. And when they went to move their utilities and get the, uh, the gas and the electricity meter readings, there was no gas or electricity meter at all. In fact, there's no gas line to the road. Now, that was three weeks ago, and they are still in this house with no power, no utilities. Uh, they've been back and forwards and they're getting mucked around by everybody. That's so, the latest thing. They've, mm-hmm. got a, they've gone to the tenants' union who uh, also gone on their behalf only to be told by the real estate agent that it's a brand new house and that's why it takes so long. Truth is, it's a very old house. It's in fact got a built-in swimming pool in the backyard that's been filled in. So it's probably a 1970s house. And they've been told they should maybe go to v- VCAT. So mm-hmm. wondering if there's any advice, David. Well, uh, the gas bit fascinates me. Um, was there a warranty or promise made that gas was connected? Uh, because, you've, I, you know, it seems to me it's a house... Lot, there are lots of houses that don't have gas connected. Right. No, well, it's got gas uh, heating. It's got a gas uh, stove. So it's got gas appliances, and they were certainly never told when they signed it that, that, that this there would was be a no, problem. That it wasn't connected to the system? No, not at all. In no. fact, they... You know, there was, you know, they've been led to believe that they've been lied to throughout the whole process and that the real estate agent has been quite duplicitous. No, 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 no. Look, I'm sorry, I can't let that go unchallenged, Peter. Yeah. The word duplicitous should never be used in connection to a real estate agent. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, uh, Maybe a little disingenuous, is that okay? Peter, we just, uh, let's, why don't we assume for the sake of the discussion that the estate agent was working on instructions from the owner? Yep, sure. Uh, and uh, the, I think the answer is VCAT, but why would you not make an application to VCAT to cancel the tenancy with effect from the date of its commencement? And perhaps damages there are um, for the cost of moving to somewhere else. Yep, yep, okay. Um, that, that's but, where I would start. But You've, where do they live? I know, well, I'm, yeah, that's no, right. no, that's, no, no. I'm not moving yeah. out until I've resolved, until I've got my application running at VCAT. Yes. Although so the that, problem is, I mean, you know, they're living in a house with no light or power. Yes. So yeah, it's, it, they might as well be camping. Well, that's right. Well, luckily they have just come back from six months camping, so they've got the gear. Okay. And, <laughs> but that's, that's not real. That's sort of cold, cold comfort, literally. No. Uh, in in my mind, you. Peter, they've, they've, you've, they've been let a house which isn't habitable. Yes, uh, correct. Uh, in, yes. In, in terms of ordinary expectations of livability, and I would be going to VCAT, and I'm saying I want this tenancy agreement cancelled, yep. and I want compensation for what you've done to me, and I want you to meet my moving costs. I would have thought it was a lay down mm. there, this one. I mean, how can they defend it? They can't. Well, they are lying. I guess it's because my daughter and her partner are just, you know, normal people who are trying to get it done and they don't have all the right... Uh, you you, could, know, issue, you could issue your VCAT application today. You could bring it on as an urgent matter. 
Yep, so yes. they just literally go straight to VCAT, tell them the story and get it. Uh, no, no, because no, the no. landlord gets an opportunity. Yeah, right. So you go, but, but v- you know, VCAT would issue an order saying you've got forty eight hours or whatever to come in and explain yourselves. Well, they? you you would VCAT's at fifty five King Street. You could go down there, yeah. and and I'm not saying that you get the matter on today, but oh, you'd get it on before the end of the week. Could the tenants union yeah. not arrange that for you, Peter? In there, that's what they're they, there for. I, I believe they try. They've tried very hard, mm-hmm. and like for example, my daughter thought the power would be on today, yeah. and the uh, the power company. Uh, contacted her to say that um, although the real estate agent said he sent it last Wednesday and paid extra for priority mailing, um, the energy company said... An extra dollar. Well, they said there's no such thing as priority, so they don't know what he's talking about, and they didn't receive it until yesterday. Ah, but Peter, you said priority mail, which is an extra dollar on the stamp. Right. Yes. (laughs) But the point is that they didn't receive it when he said he'd send it, which was last Wednesday. And then, of course, the company say it takes 48 hours for them to process it before they even begin, which will take about four days before they get it. All so right, suddenly Peter, what you on. need to do is VCAT, but your yep. daughter and your son-in-law need to work out whether they want to stay there or not yep. and whether this is just a compensation application and a requirement that services be connected or they want to bring this to an end and move. Yeah. That's a decision they need to make before they start the process because the what they ask VCAT to do depends on what they actually want as an outcome. Yes, yes. and so if, right. if their request is to I need the house fixed, that's more urgent than I'm going. I want my yeah. money back. All right, yeah. Peter. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you Peter. very much. Thanks, guys. And Bye. I imagine the compensation claim would include all the takeaway food and all of those sorts of things that they've had to resort to because of the uh, exercising to, reasonableness. Yes. Yeah, not having yeah. a kitchen that you can cook on. Yes. Oh. It's almost like a dream come true for some people. Marina in Ringwood. Morning, Marina. Oh, good morning. Yes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, David. Um, thank you for taking my call. I um, injured myself about uh, 14 months ago, a uh, bad fracture and sprain, etc., uh, on someone's property where I was going to let them know their internal car light was um, switched on after an hour walking past again. Yes, so sorry. Let's, I, you're walking down the street. You see someone's got the interior light on their car left on. That's right. When you came and back ages later, it was still on. So you went inside to say, hey, your car light's on. Yes. And, and then what happened? Is, their front porch, um, it's a downward uh, driveway, and the front porch was blacked out. And I, I've never been on the property, and there was a drop there that I didn't see, an uneven drop, and yes. so I fell. And, and, you, and, and broke your ankle. And uh, fractured and sprained and tore ligaments, etc. Ouch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was anyone so, home, Marina? Um, well, uh, I was calling out and I could uh, hear there was someone in there, but no one heard me, so I dragged myself to the front door and uh, knocked on the glass window at the bottom. And, yes. Because um, I couldn't get up. And uh, anyway, so the, the owners came and they know me because I walk past them sometimes walking. You know, in- so you have a nodding acquaintance. That's about it. What, yeah. What's the problem, Mary? Uh, well, I've, I went to. They agreed to put in a personal injury claim, which I um, called them about, and I went through the process. And then I tried to um, sort of follow it up with the insurance company. And in a nutshell, they're basically saying that um, I wasn't invited on the property, therefore they're declining the claim. And I just have a very strong feeling that I'm entitled to, um, you know, loss of income and the stress of it and not, uh, still not being able to... Marina, you, you might well be, yeah. uh, and it might also be that only invitees are covered by the by the terms of the policy. What's an invitee? Well, that someone being a someone who's actually loaded term. someone who's actually invited onto the property. Mm-hmm. But right. there's there's also a suggestion. And Marina, Marina was not invited on. Well, there's a suggestion at law, John, that there is an if the, the fact that you've got a front gate that opens is almost an implication that people are welcome to approach the front door unless and until told to go away. Will there's there not no be? Gate. Marina, if they've got insurance, are they owners or tenants? Yes, you know, they're owners. And, then, oh, no, Marina, you're going to need to see a lawyer to move it along. My view is that in the 
Let's not talk about the insurance company. My view is that the owners have a responsibility to people who enter their property. Sure, but most of us in our household insurance, we're covered for these sorts of accidents. Certainly should be, John. Yeah, so if they've got insurance for burglary, theft, disasters, those sorts of things, Marina, their insurance policy is what you're really trying to attract the attention of. And and the insurance company has come along and said, you weren't invited onto the property, therefore you don't have cover. And they'll always say that because they're trying to frighten you into going away. Yes. Well, not always. They know that I don't actually have the funds to get legal representation. Marina, talk to one of the law firms that offer no win, no fee. I've already tried that and I didn't it didn't go well and it's it's a big company and um it I had someone look at the actual contract and there were all these extra costs and I sort of did a lot of research and saw that there's really not much point because most of the money goes to the lawyers after right. all that you know so I, I wanted to see whether it was possible to pursue it myself the, that, that the answer good. is it is but um I wouldn't run my own personal injury action, Marina. But mm. you and I've been doing this for a long time. Okay. Can you recommend any lawyers that are I'd get a not- second opinion, Marina, if you went to one of those law firms that that advertise no win no fee, I'd um, ask around, see if you can find a friend who's been satisfied with where they were looked after mm-hmm. and maybe follow up a personal recommendation from some uh, someone who's had a good experience, okay? Could, could you recommend a lawyer that we doesn't can't, no. offer that? We can't, we can't do that on air. And okay. all we can do is recommend the Law Institute offers us a referral service or you can go through the various ads or find someone sure. who's got some personal experience. Okay. We're not uh, able to issue individual recommendations. The ABC doesn't countenance that level of, of connection. Okay? That's fine. Thank you so much. Thanks, all right. Marina. And good luck. Richard in Brayside, you're through to David, 26 past 10. Good morning, Richard. Oh, good day, David. Good day, John. Um, look, I just had a quick question regarding um, some dealings I've had with government agencies recently. Um, it, it, I've found that uh, when I've called them just to get some um, uh, their advice or their take on particular issues, um, they are rarely sort of giving me their position on things. So uh, in particular at the moment, I've been calling the Privacy Commissioner just to determine, um, look for our business purposes, whether or not... Um, uh, I'm trying to determine whether private company information falls within the realms of the Privacy Act. And, and the, the, the constant reply I get from the, uh, the government department is that they can't, they can't advise me on, on the issue. And no, I no Richard, but, that, but that's right. I mean, I, uh, the Immigration Department processes migration applications. They don't yeah. tell you, 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 you and they, you either succeed or fail. They don't tell you whether you've used the right form or you've applied for the right applica- the right visa. But, but, um, but and, and in privacy, we'll just come along mm. and say, we can tell you what the legislation says, yes. but we're not allowed to tell you what we think the legislation means. Nor are we here to help you. Which is well, great. you're pretty I'm, much. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, yes. But we're, we're, mm. trying to, we're trying to determine... Look, I'm trying to work out how to do the right thing here. I understand and, that, but you're and, asking them what the legislation means in your circumstances. And their answer to you will always be, we can't tell you what it means because we're not allowed to give legal advice. Yeah, I find that extraordinary. And, and but at the back end, if someone was to do something wrong, you know, you've been up front, you're trying to do the right thing. And if you take the wrong course of action, I'm sure they'd come down on us. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, 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 and I've, I've had run-ins with consumer affairs because in, in some categories of uh, the legislation that they administer, they ask for a whole lot of information they're not by law entitled to take. Mm. Right now, you know, so in mm. a sense, sometimes they don't go far enough, sometimes they go too far. Yeah, sure. And so sure. you try and have a fight with them under the Freedom of Information Act and you just get... No well, you, they, well, you get the answer that, yes, Mr Whiting, you're right, but we're not changing our policies. Sure. So, right. um, so, Richard, so no, if, they don't, won't give you advice. If Richard right. wants to deal with these agencies and they keep insisting on being at arm's length, what's the best way for him then to make inroads into their their particular area of specialisation? I mean, does he have to go mm. off and see a lawyer or become yeah. uh, proficient in the area of regulation if, in order to deal with the bureaucrats? Effectively, he needs to get either external advice or inform himself 
or he might choose to raise with the ombudsman or similar, that uh, there ought to be explanatory notes that go with the legislation. But Mm. this is happening. I mean, you've touched a really interesting point, quite frankly, Richard, which is increasingly Mm. what used to be regarded as a public service, which was to help you deal with... With you mean I'm rules. from the government and I'm here to help you? I am here mm-hmm. to help you and people were there to help you. Yes. And now their attitude is, well, no, if you don't know which form to fill in or how to fill it in or which magic words to use, that's your problem. Mm. But it's the administrative terror at the other side. They don't want to be held responsible and they can't be held responsible for something they don't tell you. No, but if you're trying to deal with whether it's immigration or Centrelink or health records and privacy or any area across the board... Everyone involved in the system and administering it knows there's all sorts of particular procedural tricks and the like that you need to be proficient at to get things done. And if they don't help you and basically be the interpreters, well, no one's got the legal literacy required from a standing start, do they? No, but remember that we now engage a whole lot of people in call centres to operate from scripts. So from a government point of view, we don't actually give them enough information to properly advise many of our consumers. We just don't. It's the same when you're dealing. I mean, you know, one of the funniest things when you're dealing with insurance companies, dealing with banks, you know, do I owe you this money? Can I make this claim? Of course the bank's going to say, yes, you owe the money. Of course the insurance company's going to say, no, we don't have to pay this claim. They're not the people you take advice from. They're the enemy. They're not your friend. Well, yeah, they're not. They're certainly not your friend. No, they're your... yeah. They're your opponent. They're your opponent, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Hence the need to get independent advice, and sometimes, yes, you just do have to pay for it. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. David Whiting, our talkback lawyer, helping you with free legal advice, as he does at 10 o'clock every Tuesday.